Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I don't have any presentation, any PowerPoint, just a few remarks. First of all, as you probably remember, I will share the task of preparing the uh, presentation for the plenary with uh, my dear friend Paolo Carozza, who was joining us. Uh, and uh, so I will give you mainly an European Italian perspective. Uh, he is an international and American legal scholar, so maybe we complement each other. Uh, I, I will start uh, uh, by some points that have been repeated uh, uh, times and again in, in these uh, previous days. Uh, my first assumption is that indeed uh, the UN Convention of 2006 uh, was, is and was a turning point uh, in the understanding and in the legal approach uh, to uh, problems of people with disabilities. So, okay, so even in Europe uh, where uh, since many years uh, we had already uh, important legal framework uh, in order to support people with disability, the UN Convention uh, was uh, a turning point. Uh, at the EU level, uh, we had already the Treaty of Amsterdam, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, a number of directive uh, fighting against uh, discrimination also on the ground of disability, but yet the UN Convention was a paradigm shift. Why so? Uh, we have already seen that is uh, from the very definition of disability that things uh, change and give us a new perspective. The definition in the UN Convention put together, links together, uh, the impairments, uh, physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory, suffered by the person in question, and uh, the environmental, social barriers uh, that hinder her full and effective participation in society. So impairment or weaknesses uh, in connection with the barriers and obstacles. Uh, this uh, renders uh, a difficulty of the people uh, proper disability. And uh, why is it so important? Because uh, this pushes uh, the legal system to try to remove uh, or to smooth uh, the barriers uh, at the social level, not only providing uh, funds, benefit, pensions, uh, or other supports to the person with disability, but also work on the other side, work on the side of the barriers uh, that are impediments uh, for the person to participate. And this reminds me to one of the most relevant uh, provision in the Italian constitution, a very, a very uh, innovative one, Article 3,2, Paragraph 2, I would like to read it. It says, uh, this is Italy, it is the duty of the Republic to remove those obstacles uh, of an economic and social nature which constrain the freedom and equality of citizens, uh, thereby impeding the full development of the human person and her effective participation in political, economic and social lives. This is really amazing for me because it seems that it's written for our purposes, for the condition of people with disabilities. Indeed, it, is, it has a broader field of application, but it is very relevant. My first point is that from this understanding of disability, there is a first important consequence. And it is that any legal approach to disability um, should include uh, positive or affirmative action. With this, this uh, positive action in favor of, uh, uh, of people with disabilities, this uh, purpose, this goal of removing obstacle would be impossible. In Europe, this is not an issue anymore. Uh, it has been accepted, it has been questioned, the possibility of uh, fighting against discrimination by means of positive or affirmative action, but I know that in the United States there is a debate, an open debate right now, and maybe you can we can listen more from Paolo. This is my first point. Then I would like to, uh, in the time that it's available to me, and please stop me, Gustavo, because I've lost the, the, the timing of our presentation, 
uh, I would like to point out the three instruments that can be that have been experienced uh, uh, in many different uh, countries and can give us some inspiration in order uh, to figure out how an appropriate legal framework to address the issues of a disability can be uh, constructed. First is the reasonable accommodation from Canadian experience. Second is an individualized or case-by-case -case approach. And the third, a question about uh, independence or uh, um, relational autonomy, as Ma Anna Marta has put it uh, this morning, very, very helpful. The first instrument is reasonable accommodation. It is one of the instruments that is mentioned in the UN Convention in Article 2. It is very much uh, used in, at the European level. We have a reasonable solution, reasonable accommodation in the EU legislation. And uh, what, is, what does it mean? What is a reasonable accommodation? I would like to not to provide a definition, but to point out some feature that distinguish this approach. It's uh, in a way the, the request to a number of subjects to adjust the condition of work, of education, of sport facilities, of the movie theaters, of the swimming pools, whatever in order to allow each person to full participate in a given context. The first point is that reasonable accommodation is addressed to both public and private actors, not only to local or national institutions, public schools, but also to NGOs and private, private employers. It was elaborated in Canada with a specific, in the specific context of labor law. So it was a request made to employers to prepare to set up a reasonable accommodation to allow people with disabilities to work in their companies or in their workplace. And uh, since it is addressed to uh, private and public uh, 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 at the same level, it is based on the duty of solidarity. Um, why reasonable accommodation? Reasonable because uh, indeed there are some limits. The, the employer must be try his best but there is a limit when it becomes an undue hardship or undue burden, then nothing more can be requested to the employers. And in, in some way, reasonable accommodation is not pre-established. It's something that set up a process uh, in which the solution is to be found in a dialogue between the employers, the employees, of the unions or other assistant. So it is relational, it is a process, it's not a rule. And but the refusal to try to get to a reasonable accommodation is treated as a form of discrimination. So there are these elements, a process, a relationship, a flexible solution, a case-by-case -case approach, but with the limits of undue burdens, both from the economic, but also from the safety point of view, uh, renders, in my view, this approach very, very interesting in many different uh, places and cases. And it also it can be a good expression of a number of qualities uh, that have been pointed out in our previous discussion. So reasonable accommodation is a, a concept worth exploring more uh, and in different uh, countries and in different uh, areas of uh, social life. Second, uh, after all what we have heard in this past day, I think that all of us are very much, much more aware that disability calls for case-by-case -case measures, personalized and individualized. Uh, Christoph Engel said very effectively in one of the uh, summaries of a previous uh, session 
no single person with disability is similar to the next one, nor are the social condition where she lives. And I think that this is really a wonderful summary of what we have said. So this come a difficult point for legislation because usually uh, law and legislation work and is based on rules and categories. We prepare rules that are to be applied to certain groups of people. But if the borders between different groups, let's say disabled or uh, functional people, is blurred, it becomes difficult to apply rules. So this is an important uh, remark that we have made in the past days because I think that this calls us to think to the legal framework in a different way. We have a need a legal framework that leaves rooms for a case-by-case -case approach, flexible rules, rules that are susceptible to be applied in different way to different cases. We have some sign of this uh, uh, approach to legal framework for disabilities. For example, in some cases in the European Court of Human Rights, when the court speaks about degradation of state measures, saying, for example, that it is not necessary to take away the right to vote to any disabled person under partial guardianship, it depends on the actual faculties that she still keeps. Or in other cases where the court says it is not necessary to remove children from their family when parents have mental or psychological impairments unless it is necessary. Under a different perspective, for example, I can remark a difference, a, a change in the legislation that uh, took place in Italy as far as the work, uh, the inclusion of uh, people with disability in work uh, is concerned. Uh, in an old legislation dating back to 1968, uh, we had a number of compulsory hiring of a certain number of disabled people for companies that were bigger, that reached a certain size. But it was just, a, let's say, an, an approach based on numbers. If you have more than 35 workers, you have to hire at least 15% of people with disability, regardless their ability or the need of the companies of the employers. Now we have a new legislation. I don't have uh, any evidence of how it is worked and in, how it is implemented, but the idea is good. It says that you have to find an appropriate job for disabled people, taking into consideration her special uh, aspirations as well as her special uh, abilities. I think that this personal or case-by-case -case approach uh, is necessary if we want to give value, to recognize, to give dignity to all the residual capabilities of the person with disabilities. We have to focus not only on her weaknesses, but also on her residual capabilities, her talents. We have said that disability is an opportunity. There are talents, but we have to bring them to light and to give value also in the legal system. My final remarks is I have uh, uh, five more minutes, If I, otherwise I will skip it. It concerns uh, independence versus uh, relational autonomy. Because, uh, can I? Yeah, because sure, this sure, is... Marta. Thank you. This was a point that was pointed out by Anna Marta, but also by Rocco Buttiglione in, uh, in, in, the, in the remarks this morning. And it is a, a very central point because the UN Convention in Article 3 speaks about independence, individual autonomy as a goal to be pursued by in, 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 uh, for the people with disabilities. But uh, here, and here I can see the echo of a general approach uh, to human rights, uh, especially uh, starting from the end of the last century. Paolo and myself uh, have been working on these problems uh, 
uh, let's say, following the steps of uh, people like Marianne Glendon, for example, she wrote a wonderful book on this point, uh, showing how the uh, new age of right is all based on the idea of uh, autonomy, self-determination, independence, uh, which is uh, uh, the description of an abstract individual. This liberal approach uh, has been debated on the one hand, from some parts of the feminist legal scholars, Anna Marta mentioned some of them, but also by other people, Michael Sandel, Marianne Glendon, and other people. What is the problem with this idea? It is, in my view, the flaw is that this uh, um, portrait of the human person that is uh, implied in this approach to human rights uh, is not realistic, is abstract. There is a, a, a description in a more recent work by Marianne Glendon in 2004. She said, let me quote, it is just a couple of sentences. Despite our attachment to the idea of the free self-determining individual, we humans are dependent social beings. We still begin our lives in the longest period of dependency of any mammals. Almost all of us spend much of our lives either as dependents or caring from dependents for dependents or financially responsible for dependents. And this is something that we have to come to turn with. I think that here there is something, an added value that we, it's a, 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 difficult, a difficult issue because we are uh, against the mainstream understanding of human rights. But I think that the, uh, our discussion here could bring some uh, important step forward in the understanding, not only of uh, rights for disabled people, but in the understanding of individual rights as such. And I think that there are signs in the legislation that a different approach can be taken. I am finishing, but I would like to close with a couple of examples taken from uh, the legislation in force in Italy. Uh, in Italy, for example, for children with disability, since many, many years, we have the insegnante di sostegno, the teacher for support. It's a huge number of teachers. It is about 200,000 of support teaching teachers um, out of 950,000 uh, teachers in um, the overall in the public schools. What, what is the purpose of this? To allow all students to stay in class with the other students, but with the support of somebody that is on their side. The same has been experienced for the elderly or for other people that temporarily or permanently come through a difficulty in their life with the amministratore di sostegno is somebody, a friend, a family member, or somebody that is chosen by the person that without declaring that the person, uh, uh, the incapacity of the person from the civic point of view, helps her, for example, in some uh, uh, operation uh, negotiation. I had a case that when I was in a constitutional court, it was a so, uh, an old lady that wanted to donate to one of her children 10,000 euros, but since she was partially incapacitated, she was forbidden by the legislation. With the help of the administratore di sostegno, this sort of tutor, she was rendered able to do this, to donate as an expression of her uh, desire to be on the side of one of the children that wanted to get married. So, in my view, uh, we can try to figure out the ways in which the idea of pursuing autonomy and to give value to the capability of the person is done 
uh, not only uh, with the help of some mechanical and uh, other instrumental uh, support, but also putting other people on the side and so supporting those who take care of uh, those people. This thing, I think uh, it's a sort of uh, getting becoming autonomous with a little help of our friends echoing the beatles we are all boomers so we know very well the, this kind of um, um this phrase that has been sounded in many times in our lives so i will stop here just to, to open up the discussion uh, on a very broad uh, issue from the legal point of view thank you so much